Uh, good morning. So I mentioned earlier that um, that my job consists of uh, looking over the latest gadgets and um, and writing them up. So in this breakout session, I'm going to um, retreat from that macro view of trends in technology and look more at individual gadgets that I think are cool. Um, this is uh, the name of the talk when I give it for corporations get paid a lot of money. Uh, for this one, it's going to be called Dave's Mobile Gadget Funhouse. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I find it crazy that we are still in an era where we have to hunt for an internet connection. Um, I think when, when we're 100, we're going to tell our grandchildren, when I was your age and I wanted to check my email, I used to have to drive around town looking for a coffee shop. I did. I just think it's nuts. Oh, they had Wi-Fi hotspots. Yeah, 150 feet across. They did. You know, it's like, dude, we build electrical outlets and running water and heating and cooling into every building in America. Where's the internet? Why isn't it just accepted and standard and universal and ubiquitous? I don't understand that. Um, so we're getting there. Um, for a couple years now, you've been able to buy these little USB or, or card slot cards that go into your laptop and give the laptop um, an internet connection that uses the cell phone airwaves as the internet connection. Um, bunch of problems with that. It's really expensive. 60 bucks, bucks a month, um, not DLS, DSL speeds. Oops, sorry, typo there. Um, uh, the speed is, is okay, but only in a big city. If you're not in a big city, you don't get on the online or you get a really slow connection and requires the purchase of one of these. And every time you want to get online, you have to find it in your luggage and insert it and start it up. And of course, it does no good at all if you have some other gadget that isn't cellular um, or that has no place to stick this. So um, let me just see here. I am interestingly not getting uh, mirroring, that's why. Okay, there you go. You weren't supposed to see that. Um, there we go. Um, and um, the, the solution, in, part of the solution is this puppy. This is called the MiFi, and it's sold by Sprint or Verizon. And basically, let me see if I can do this high tech switcheroo here. Um, basically, um, it is a, um, well, in, in essence, it's a converter between cellular and Wi Fi, but what it does is it gives you a personal, battery powered, pocketable, portable hotspot. So this is Wi Fi, and any of you can get on right now. If you look in your menu bar, you'll see this. It'll have, say, Verizon something, right? Can you see it? And if I were to share the password with you, which is on the bottom, you could join me in hotspot goodness. Um, but of course, you have a much better one provided by <laughs> this building, so you don't need that. But imagine if you were stuck on a plane or in a car driving with the kids. Um, it's so amazing to have a Wi-Fi bubble that's with you wherever you go. Um, truly cool. And um, especially, by the way, if you have an iPod uh, Touch, if you think about it, an iPod Touch plus a MiFi is a cell phone. Suddenly the iPod Touch can make regular calls uh, wherever you go. And, or, an iPod, or an iPad, which is not normally a telephone, now it's a telephone. Um, so really totally cool. I was on a, a plane stuck on the tarmac for three hours at one point. And um, so I opened up my laptop and I was working away and I noticed the guy next to me was kind of like, you know, I kind of wish I had one of those 3M screen polarizers because the guy was like clearly like trying to see my screen. And finally I realized he wasn't looking at what I was writing. He was, look, he was obsessed with the fact that I had a four bar Wi-Fi hotspot on my menu bar. And we were like way out on the runway. And he's like, I'm sorry, but how are you doing that? <laughs> he like could not figure it out. It was because I had this in my, in my bag. I, I, I don't even take it out of the bag. It runs four or five hours on a charge, and you just leave it in there. Leave it in your purse, leave it in your bag. Uh, you've got a hotspot wherever you go. Totally, totally amazing. Um, <coughs> now, the company that makes it, Novatel, 
is adding these really ingenious apps. Yes, everything has to have apps now. They're adding apps to the My5. Um, and for example, one of them is, you guys are geeks like me, so you know about VPN, virtual private networking. You know that if you want to connect in to the school network or a corporate network, sorry, <clears throat> you need to use this proprietary uh, protected tunnel, secure tunnel through the internet so that you can't be hacked or secrets can't be sapped away from your connection. So it's a big, it's a hassle to get on VPN, right? You have to, on your laptop, you have to open up a VPN gateway app. You have to put in your name, your password, click connect, <coughs> and so on before you can use your email or your web browser. So what they've done is they have an app for the MiFi that has its own VPN software and it stores your name and password and all that. So the bottom line is as soon as you turn it on, it auto connects to the network, makes the VPN tunnel um, automatically. So all you have to do is open your laptop or your iPod or your iPhone or whatever and pretend like you're not on VPN at all. You're instantly connected, really ingenious. Um, here's another cool thing they've done. They, um, they have built a webmail app into the, into the MiFi. So the idea is you wake up in the morning, you turn that thing on, you run out the door to work, it's quietly downloading your email from the internet without your laptop being on yet. And you get on the plane and you go on your flight. Now you have time to settle down and get some work done. Only then you open your laptop. It retrieves the stored email that you've, that's waiting for you from the MiFi. So you don't have an internet connection anymore, but you don't care because all the MiFi downloaded the email and it's been holding it for you um, so that you can grab it on the laptop. Very cool idea. Um, and um, it also lets you view the email on any, any gadget with a, with a browser like this or whatever. It doesn't have to be uh, an actual laptop. Um, and the other advantage of, of something like this is that um, there are lots of other things besides laptops that use Wi-Fi these days. So there are digital cameras. There are, th do you know about this iFi card? This thing's totally cool. It's a, it's a memory card, you know, this big regular two or four gig memory card for your camera that adds Wi-Fi to any camera. So any camera now has Wi-Fi such that um, you sign up in advance and tell, tell it what you want done with your pictures. And you have two choices. You can have them sent to your computer at home over Wi-Fi, or you can have them posted to any of 25 different photo gallery websites like Flickr or Shutterfly or Photo Gallery. And, um, and it does that automatically. You don't have to do anything to it. The next time you're in a hot spot, off they go from this little tiny card. I don't know how they got Wi-Fi into something that size, but they did. And uh, the latest version has a really amazing feature called Bottomless Memory Card, where it's perpetually uploading the pictures you've taken back home to your computer and then erasing them. So the card never fills. It never fills up. You can shoot perpetually and never run out of space. It's such a crazy idea. And also, you know, for years the iFi card has always uploaded everything. Um, well, well, all the JPEGs. It didn't upload movies and it didn't upload raw files. And of course it's because every camera is different. It can't have buttons or menus because it's just a card. It can't put up a custom display for each model of camera. But somehow, the model that came out last month now uploads movies and RAW files and lets you choose which ones to upload. I can't quite figure out how they've done that, but I, haven't, I just read the press release. I haven't tried that one out. But anyway, so, and then um, you know, the lower right is a, is a Wi-Fi picture frame, um, the digital picture frames. <clears throat> did, did you guys ever hear of this thing called the SIVA? Frame. I'm such a freaking loser. I bought two of these. You, it's a digital picture frame that connects to a phone jack and you give it to your parents. Right? So I gave one to my father-in-law and then I gave one and then I bought another one for my own parents. 
gave the one to my father-in-law. Now from home, I can upload pictures to it. So this technophobe who doesn't know how to turn on anything can wake up each morning and find fresh pictures from me. Um, great idea, but it's a hundred bucks a year, and if you stop paying, the frame is worthless. It does nothing. Can't load pictures onto it any other way. And so, like after two years of this, I'm like, what have I done? I'm locked into this piece of crap forever. And so, meanwhile, I'm like holding this other one that I had for my mom, and I'm like. You know, I'd actually come out ahead if I just threw it away right now. <laughs> and so it's, it's sitting in my office. I never used it. And now, of course, you can do the same thing for free with any Wi-Fi picture frame. I can, I can send those to my mother the same way. And so I feel like a total schmuck for falling for that SIVA frame twice. Um, anyway, um, and then, of course, e-readers. Uh, actually, the, the e-readers, the, uh, this is the, th that's the Kindle, and this is the Sony Daily Edition. They get online via um, cellular connection, and the idea there is, and it's free. This is really interesting. What other cellular gadget do you have that's free to use the cellular? It's amazing. Um, and the idea is that they, these, these book companies, have, Amazon and Sony, have struck up deals with Sprint, or AT&T to provide that free uh, cellular so that you can be like at a party and someone says, oh, have you read Freakonomics? And you're like, well, no, but I will now. Ah, you know, and you get it in 30 seconds. You download it over the airwaves straight to your, to your reader. Um, it's really quite, <clears throat> quite brilliant and quite addicting. You lower the barriers low enough to buying stuff and people will buy stuff. It's uh, pretty amazing. Um, Speaking of cellular plans, this is really incredible. Um, Steve Jobs, in his reali reality distortion field, persuaded AT&T to offer the following deal for the iPad. There's a, a version, this one has Wi-Fi, but there's also a version that has Wi-Fi and cellular, just like the iPhone. And the deal is, you can pay, when you need to get online, you can pay $15. Uh, one time, and that will get you 250 megabytes of downloaded data, or $30 for unlimited data for a whole month. And the amazing thing is, it's a one shot. You you, you do it right on here. You, you don't have to call anyone or go to a web page. There's a. It's in preferences. You just say buy the $15 or buy the $30, and you just get it for that month. You can then you can say cancel like right away. You've still got it for the next month or for the next 250 megs, but it won't be renewed. So there's no contract, there's no two-year commitment, there's no overage charges, there's no penalties. It's, it's just like amazing and it's so consumer friendly, I don't know what went wrong. Uh, I, I can imagine all the other cell phone companies are like, what, AT&T, you idiot! What are you doing? We had it made, man! You know, we got everybody used to a two-year commitment, you blown it! You know, now, now everybody's going to sort of expect that that's, that's what we can do. We can buy data when we need it and not pay for it the months we're not traveling. It's like phenomenal. Um, I spoke earlier about um, the miracle of apps, these incredibly cheap, incredibly various creative little apps for app phones and now these tablets. Um, and one of the coolest categories I didn't get into this morning is augmented reality apps. And what these are, they combine all the sensors in neat ways. So this one's called Nearest Tube. It's for the London subway system. You hold the thing and look at the ground, and it superimposes what subway is beneath your feet. And if you hold it up like this, it tells you which subway stops you'll find if you walk in that direction. Totally cool. This is another augmented reality app. It, you hold it up to the air, and it shows you who's on Twitter in that direction and what they're saying. So you can look at a building and see who's in there. This one's called TAT, and I think it's just a prototype at this point, but it recognizes who it is and then displays their contact information and what social networks they're on <clears throat> right there so you can connect to them later. <coughs> and. Oops, I thought I had one more. Well, here's, here's another one. This one, and these are in the App Store right now. So they're using all the sensors of the phone to superimpose 
real data on top of the video camera image. So it's kind of like, it helps, it, it's like your eyes with added data, like a heads up display. Um, this is another real one. I'm colorblind, and I've always wished I had something like this. I go to my closet, I hold it up to a piece of clothing, and it tells me what color that clothing is. I think that's totally cool. Um, this one I made up, but um, <clears throat> but give it time, it'll, uh, it'll come. Um, this morning I, I talked about appless apps, um, cell phone apps that connect to the internet don't require a fancy phone like the Google Info and Cha Cha, um, but I didn't get to Aardvark. This is one of the coolest things. So the world is filled with interesting ways to get answers to questions quickly using the internet. You could ask people on Twitter, but that's a very unfocused sort of, if you have a lot, it needs a lot of followers to get a good answer, and meanwhile you're asking everybody at once. Um, it's not a very targeted query. And then there's these Cha Cha and these Google, and Google things, but that requires uh, a cell phone, and it's just, and that's good only for facts and not for opinion. So I need to buy a good drum set for my 10 year old, you know, what's a good book series to take on vacation? You're not going to get that from Cha Cha or a Google search, for example. So there's this third thing, category thing called Aardvark. Oh, that's me. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, you people are so rude <laughs> watching videos. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, not my morning. Um, so, um, uh, so Aardvark works like this. You, you send a question to it by email or in your chat program, and it farms that question to like two or three people who are the best uh, of the best people to answer it. And these are people who are in your Facebook network. It requires that you have a Facebook account. In your Facebook network, uh, among your friends, and if there are no friends in your Facebook network who have expertise on that subject and who have signed up to field questions from Aardvark, it expands the search to their friends and then to their friends. So within two steps, you've covered several million people and a bunch of them will know the answer. It is phenomenal. You get an answer 10 seconds later, you get two or three answers, and you can just type back thanks, or you can follow up with a question, and it handles all the addressing and all the channeling for you. So, so all you know is you say, uh, you know, I'm going to San Diego next week, um, what's a great Cuban restaurant? I don't know. And then here are the answers, you just type thanks, and it's free, and people sign up to be the answer providers. I mean, Aardvark, they were just bought by Google for $500 million. Google's buying everybody, so everybody good. So why do people volunteer to be answer providers for Aardvark questions? Would you? Well, the answer is you probably would, because it makes you feel good the people want your opinion, and, and it makes you feel good to be the one who has the answer. And again, it's about barriers to entry. They've, they've made it so simple. It's not a big deal. You're working, something comes up, <laughs> chat program. You know, I'm going to Lancaster, uh, need a good veterinarian. <laughs> you know, so you go, oh, go here. And then they write back, hey, thanks. And it's, it's taking you two seconds. It's an answer you already knew, and no money changes hands, but you have that rosy glow of helping out. It's incredible how they've managed to, har to harness the, the, the crowdsourcing wisdom of the internet in that way. It's really, truly amazing. Um, another thing I'm loving lately is uh, the new era of gymnastic phones. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you've seen this. This is the backflip. But right now, cell phones have a, quite a design challenge, right? You need a keyboard. You need a screen. And you want each to be as big as possible. So this is kind of a one approach. You get half a screen. 
and you get a little tiny keyboard that's the wrong way, right? It's narrow. What you want is a keyboard that goes this way because the keys can be much wider. And so there's all kinds of, you know, you have the ones that have a keyboard that slides out like this. You have ones that open like a book and the screen's up here and the keyboard's here. But all of those are in their own way sort of limiting. Um, so what I like is, um, oops, wait. Uh, this is really cool. So this is the Motorola Backflip. And what they've done is, let me see if I can explain this to you. So this, the keyboard is on the back. And when you're using it as a phone, the, the, the lights turn off and you don't see any of these, these labels. And you have just a touchscreen phone, full-size touchscreen. And the back just feels sort of textured. You don't see the keyboard. But when you need the keyboard, it opens up. It flips like this. So you see how the keyboard's on the back? And it flips up like this. Now you have a full keyboard laid out the way you want it. And you have a full touch screen at the same time. But what's really interesting is now you have all this dead space on the back. And what's so clever is they decided to use that. This is a touch pad. So you're sitting here. You're holding the thing like this. And you're moving the cursor back here. No one's ever thought of that. And it works perfectly. You're highlighting icons. Why not go from behind the icons? It's, 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 a, it's a touch. It's, you can scroll and, and move around like that. And it's, it's even clever. I actually brought one, but like a schmuck. I left it plugged in in the hotel room. It's charging, so it would work when I showed you. Um, <laughs> um, what you can do is, um, is if you put it on a level surface and open it only 90 degrees, it says, oh, I see what you're doing. You are plugging, oh, and you plug it in. You're recharging me. What do most, what do you usually do with your phone when you come home and you plug it in? What's the, what good is the phone doing you right now? Nothing. It's just sitting there charging. These guys thought, well, it's still a phone, it's still a computer, it's still got a screen. Let's have it do something useful. So you go like this, and it immediately turns into an alarm clock. The world's best, great big digits with little, here, I'll show you because the droid does the same thing. Um, oh wait, maybe there's a, is there a picture of it? Um, um, no, of course not. Um, well, you get the same effect with the, um, with the droid phone. Um, and I, did a, I do these, these videos. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop, 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 stop. Um, yeah, please feel free to read all my email. Um, here, let's pause this. That's playing for a reason, um, which we'll get to in a second. Okay, so I do these videos every week for CNBC. And th this one was an end of the year thing called the Pogi Awards. And this is the part about the droid. Good evening, and welcome to the fifth annual Pogi Awards. As you know, the Pogi Awards are designed to celebrate innovation in technology, not just to the best products, but to the best ideas in products. And these days, with global warming, wars, and a wobbly economy, it's nice to have something to celebrate. All right, then. <laughs> Our first category, the Buy It Once, Use It Anywhere category, goes to the Motorola Droid Accessory Docks. At first glance, the droid is just another iPhone wannabe. Download apps, do your email, and so on. But this $30 windshield dock instantly turns the phone into a full-blown GPS unit with spoken driving directions, street names, even color-coded traffic indicators. Or put the phone into the $30 bedside dock and you have an instant alarm clock, complete with one-touch weather, all your music, even a dimmer switch. Next up, the software award. And it goes to the iType to Go app. We all know that text messaging is dangerous if you're driving, but it's also dangerous when you're walking. But not if your phone has iType to Go. It lets you see through the background of your text message or your email or Facebook or Twitter updates so you don't walk into things. Great idea. And it's only a dollar. Next up, we have the. All right. Well, anyway, um, so the, uh, the 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 backflip phone uses exactly that same alarm clock display that you just saw. So <clears throat> such a good idea. 
you really, for my job, it's the ideas that get me fired up. I just, I love when someone thinks of something like that that no one's ever thought of before. Um, so, yeah, that, and that's the, that's the droid. That was the first really decent iPhone competitor. They managed to, you know, Apple always said the reason we don't have a real keyboard is because it would make the thing too thick. Um, well, guess what? The Motorola Droid is the same thickness as an iPhone, and they have a slide-out keyboard. So, um, the, uh, what's so weird is that Steve Jobs is so obsessed with thinness, but you know how the, the new iPhone that coming out in June was found, was left in a bar by a drunk Apple employee on his birthday? Um, it's, not, uh, it's not sleek anymore. It's, a, it's, a, it's like squared off. It's thick. It's, uh, I'm, I'm really surprised that, that, that Apple would go to less sleek and less sculpted. But the battery lasts much longer. I'm sure that's why they did it. Um, do you guys know who Jeff Hawkins is? Jeff Hawkins invented the Palm Pilot. And he founded Palm Computing. And you may remember the first Palm Pilot was a brick. I mean, it had sharp edges. It was a, it was a rectangular cube. And um, it was you know, squared off like this. And the reason is Jeff Hawkins said that rounded edges waste space because you, your circuit board cannot occupy a curved edge. The circuit board can only be rectangular and it can only go, or your battery or whatever component, it can't curve. So all of the curved edges are wasted empty air. There's nothing in the curved edges um, because everything has to be rectangular. Um, so maybe that's why. So a few interesting things going on in communication. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Skype, uh, free program that makes free uh, calls to anyone in the world. Uh, very, very good quality. Um, the, the downside is that you have to make the calls wearing a headset like a nerd and sitting at your computer. If you want to make calls from your computer to an actual phone number, then you have to pay. It's not very much. It's a couple of cents a minute. But, it's in, but you have to sign up for it and reload. It just doesn't have the convenience. It's a higher barrier than using the regular phone. <clears throat> um, so there's some interesting developments there. Um, as you know, Skype does video, and so does iChat, and all these other similar apps. Um, I was, this is a, a shot from, um, I, I, was, I was in London um, for a week giving talks, and it was the first time I'd ever been away from my children, who were like two and four, and um, I, I was really not doing well in London. I thought, oh my god, you know, the kids are probably like, where's daddy, where's daddy? Is he dead? Is he? You know, so, and I was really sick, and I was depressed, and the weather was horrible, and just a total England experience. And so, at the end of the talk, um, I said, uh, "Hey, by the way, I have to turn in my column. Does anyone know if there's like a Wi-Fi coffee shop nearby?" And at the end of the talk, a guy said, "Oh, well, there's one nearby. I'll take you, mate. Come on." And so we go to this coffee shop, and um, and he said, "Yes, I always come here and, and do." Video, oh, I chat with me mates in Wisconsin, USA. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I could, I could do iChat. I could do iChat with home. I could do it right now. So I like emailed my wife, and I'm like, I mean, you know, it's free. It doesn't matter that it's international, right? It's still free. So she got on, and, and we did this very first video iChat um, transatlantic, transatlantically. It was amazing. I was like holding up my laptop, showing her the pastries, and she's like, oh, get me one of those chocolate croissants. It was like really funny. And so then she got the kids up, and there I was, live on the screen from 3,000 miles across the ocean, six hours ahead in time, and live on the screen, video chatting with my kids, and they were completely blasé. They're like, hi, Dad. <laughs> Tia, quit it. And I'm like, oh, I guess I didn't need to worry. Um, it was, they were completely nonplussed. But anyway, so the first thing that came along was this gadget, uh, which I imagine no one will buy ever again, but it, it let you do Skype over Wi-Fi in your house. So it was like having a Wi-Fi Skype cell phone. And a couple of companies made them. And again, it was the same thing as making Skype calls, except now you didn't need to be at your computer. You could be wandering around the house and doing work. And now, of course, there is Skype on your app phone. Same thing, which means that whenever you are in a Wi-Fi hotspot, you can make those same free calls to other people who have Skype on their Blackberries and iPhones. 
Uh, it's just audio, it's not video. Um, but it's free calls and um, so th this, this technology of conducting voice over the internet is just completely lethal to the phone companies. Um, they, it's so cute to watch them squirm. Um, they, the number of people with landlines has gone down 35% in three years. Everyone, I mean, college kids don't have landlines. I, I cut my landline last week. I got rid of it. It's like, no one ever calls that number. Why am I using this? Uh, why am I paying for this? In fact, the real mind blower is this. This is an iPhone app. And this is just one of the most remarkable things of my career. This is an iPhone app that costs a dollar. And then um, for, it's 15 bucks a month. But what it does is it gives you a second phone line on your iPhone with its own phone number. They could use it like for, as your business line. But no other app, and, and what happens is whenever you're in Wi-Fi, it makes the calls over Wi-Fi automatically. And if you are out of Wi-Fi, it uses the regular AT&T uh, connection. But the beauty of it's using Wi-Fi is that doesn't use any AT&T minutes. So what you can do is you can change your AT&T plan to the cheapest one, the $40 plan, and only use those 450 minutes when you're not in Wi-Fi. And when are you in Wi-Fi? At home and at work most of your life. So really amazing. And incoming calls, same thing. Incoming calls automatically goes over Wi-Fi um, if you're in Wi-Fi. And what else is cool about Wi-Fi? Well, it's international. The inter on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog and nobody knows you're in France. So all calls from this thing home are free. Free calls home to the United States. And the, um, the interface is exactly the same as the iPhone app. So this is, um, uh, here, let's see what I can do. <clears throat> or you can just trust me. Um, so there's, hey, doc. So yeah, so there's uh, favorites and missed calls and your address book and the dialer pad and visual voicemail. It looks exactly like the iPhones. And, um, but the only difference is now you have two lines and you can make most of the calls over Wi-Fi. Oh, and there's something else really cool. If you and the other guy both have line two and you're both in Wi-Fi, the calls you make, oh, and it's not like Skype where you're dialing a handle, you know, ferret lover 23. These are, sorry, bad example. Um, these are real phone numbers. It's a real phone app. You're dialing phone numbers and getting phone calls. Everyone's like, well, Skype's done that for years. No, it's totally different. It is a real phone. OK, so um, if you and the other guy both have line two and you're both in Wi-Fi, it switches to 16-bit mode, which is like CD. You sound like you're talking to someone on an FM radio station. I mean, the sound quality is incredible. In fact, some people don't like it because you hear every rustle there are clothes and you know, every little, you know, it's just almost gross. Um, so really amazing. And it is death to the cell companies. I mean, it's giving you a phone that's free. No minutes. It's revolutionary. Um, I love cameras a lot. There's a lot of really interesting thing happening in, in cameras. Um, I'm happy to say that the megapixel race is, is over. Um, for years, people kept trying to say, oh, our camera has more megapixels, which is just a complete boondoggle. They tried to make us think that uh, more megapixels makes better pictures. It does not. Megapixels just measures how many millions of little dots make up the same crappy picture. right? So it has nothing to do with picture quality, nothing at all. And people would say, oh, but you need more megapixels to make big prints, bull. I did a test for a TV show for Discovery where I took the same picture at 5, 8, and 13 megapixels, blew them up to movie poster size, and put them up on easels in Times Square. And I had people sop in off the street and see if they could guess which one was 5, which was 8, and which was 13 megapixels. Same picture. And they were even allowed to do stuff that you wouldn't even do to a big enlargement. They were like looking like this. 
You know, and no one looks at a picture that way, for one thing. But do you know of a hundred people, how many got? Well, first of all, I'll tell you a hint. Most people gave up. Most people said, I can't see any difference. So of the people who actually made a guess, how many got them right? One. One person correctly got, and I think it was just the luck of the draw. So, um, so the really cool thing is now camera companies are starting to focus their R&D efforts on things that really matter, things we care about. This camera, for example, this camera is real. Oh, no! Oh, my God! Oh, sorry. So this camera. Oh, jeez! Oh, jeez! Oh, my God! Um, so this camera is one of a new series of ruggedized, waterproof, dustproof, freeze-proof camera. Wow, that one really went far. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, what are you trying to wreck my stuff, dude? Just kidding. <laughs> It's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah. Like your heart, it is. your heart races, but but it's meant for it. Woohoo! Six feet onto concrete. That's pretty good. That's what it's, it's rated for. I've been doing this, you know, for days. I don't take pictures with it. I just do that. It's like, oh, for God's sake! Um, <laughs> one time, this reminds me. I, I, I was speaking at a uh, at a conference given by O'Reilly, the technical book company. And um, they, they had, it was a bunch of geeks in the audience, right? They all had their laptops open. And they were using this app called SubEtha Edit, which is a collaborative Wi-Fi note-taking app. So instead of everybody taking the same notes, they collaborated on notes. Everybody chipped in, like Wikipedia. And one year, O'Reilly thought it would be cute if they projected that collaborative chat room on the big screen while the speaker was talking. And it, yeah, I think you see where this is going. Um, it had its downsides. You know, the speaker would say something, and people in the room would go, "That's not true," you know, and they'd, they'd like put up a link to a website that disproved whatever the guy just said. But one day, the the speaker's cell phone went off while he was speaking, and uh, he's like, "Oh, it's just my son." And somebody in the chat room goes, "The cat's in the cradle and the silver spoons." <laughs> <laughs> so they discontinued that experiment. Um, but anyway, but I love this. This camera is an underwater camera. Oh, for... Hello? Hey, I'm giving a talk right now. Can I call you back? Yep. Yeah, I'll give you a call back. All right. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs> what part of I'm giving a talk didn't you understand? Um, so anyway, so I love the fact that they're making these cameras tougher and waterproof and dustproof and freeze-proof. Um, <clears throat> but the, the more important thing that they're doing is they're focusing on making them take better pictures, which you could argue is a good feature to have in a camera. Um, the difference between pocket cameras and SLRs is, well, first of all, you can tell right away when a picture was taken by an SLR. I mean, they're much better in low light. They have this amazing, uh, so this, you know, no flash pictures. You never pull that off with a camera like this. That requires an SLR, one of the big black ones. Um, they have amazing control over depth of field, which is that photographic effect where the subject is sharp, but the background is blurry. Or in this case, the background and the foreground are blurry, and only the subject in the middle ground is in focus. So what's the difference between, what makes these differences? Well, the lenses, of course, um, but the primary difference in quality it depends on the size of the sensor in the camera. These cameras have tiny sensors, not even that big. That's the G3. That's a mid-range sensor. The ones in here are about half the size of your pinky fingernail, about half of that size. They're tiny. They can't absorb much light at all, so they're terrible in low light, so you get blur or grain in a lot of your, your pictures. Um, a digital Rebel has a sensor this size. Um, the, the, more, the nicer cameras like the Nikon D90 
have a sensor this size, and the $5,000 professional cameras are full frame, same size as a piece of film. They're giant. The, the, the cameras today, the full frame cameras today, are more light sensitive than we are. You can take a picture in a room and see more stuff clearly in the picture than your eye could even pick out. It's amazing what they're doing. <clears throat> but what I would like, I think what most of the world would like, is a camera like this with a chip like this. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> that is what the world wants. And the camera companies are finally starting to pay attention. So in the last year, we saw this amazing development. Um, uh, Panasonic and um, Olympus got together and developed a new line of cameras where they, they took out the SLR part of an SLR. That is normally the light comes in the lens, it goes into this mirror box and bounces. Uh, it's, it, there's a, a 45 degree half mirror that sends the light into the sensor but also bounces it through a bunch of prisms into your eye. So you hold it up to your eye, you're actually looking out through the lens through these prisms. And they got rid of all that. The light comes straight into the sensor and that sends an electronic image to the viewfinder, like a little tiny TV screen in there. Um, and by getting rid of the mirror box, they could collapse the whole camera design and make them much smaller. Now that's, and, and, and still use the same size chip sensor that's in the big one. So it might not look like that huge an improvement, but they've continued to make those smaller and smaller. Um, so here are the latest one. So, so this is a micro four thirds camera that's come out since then. It's, it looks like, you know, it's about this big. It's not, it's not this small, but it's not an SLR either. And they take uh, really, really beautiful pictures in a revolutionarily small size. And they still have interchangeable lenses. So wide angle, super zoom, whatever you want. Um, the other really exciting thing is that some companies are approaching the problem from the other end. This, instead of taking an SLR and trying to make it smaller, they're taking a pocket camera and trying to make the chip and the sensor inside bigger. This is the Canon S90. It looks like a regular pocket camera. It's not the chip in there. It's not as big as an SLR or even a micro four thirds, but it's, it's maybe as big as your whole thumbnail. It's much, much bigger. So in low light, I mean, I can go like this and get these incredible pictures with no flash, totally handheld, and, um, and people are just drooling over this. And Samsung has one coming out that's the same idea. This number here is a measurement of how much light gets through the lens to the sensor. And normally they're like, on pocket cameras, it's four point something, which is pretty lousy. 2.0 and 1.8 are remarkable for a tiny camera, never been done before. And um, so we're finally getting there where we can have cameras that, little cameras that take really good pictures. So um, another broad category of, of developing, developing stuff is, uh, is entertainment. I don't know if you know about this thing, the sling box. Um, it's a box you connect to your, um, into your TV at home. And then from anywhere, from your iPhone, from your Blackberry, from your laptop, you can watch your TV from home. So you're already paying for cable TV service. Why should it be rooted to your couch? Why should it be viewable only there? The concept here is this thing takes whatever you've got, TiVo, DVD player, your cable box, up to three sources, and blasts it over the internet to wherever you are so you can watch that stuff on your iPhone, your Blackberry, or your laptop. So it's really, and, and, and there's no fee. You just buy the box, which is really cool. So you can sit in some hotel room where you have a choice. You can watch a pay-per-view movie for you know, $35, um, or you can watch movies that you've got at home on your TiVo or on HBO at home um, over the internet, and the quality is remarkably good and uh, really cool idea. Um, and this is also, this is another really, really totally amazing thing. Um, you know about Netflix, right? You pay $9 a month or whatever, and they mail you DVDs. You, you go to the website, you build this list of movies you'd like to see, and as soon as you mail one back in the prepaid envelope, they ship out the next one in your list. But the problem is that with that is you have to wait a day. You know, I mean, that's ridiculous. Wait a whole day for a movie? So, um, so now they have this thing called Watch Now, 
And basically what that does, oops, this is it. They have 15,000 movies available to watch immediately. Uh, where's the, uh, there's a full screen mode, yeah. This is the proposal, that Sandra Bullock movie. And I never said I was poor. She never told me you were rich. I'm not rich. Uh, so, okay, so it looks like um, <clears throat> it looks like this. Um, uh, oh, here we go. I can see up here. So now these movies don't just say rent; they say play. You just you can search them and and play them immediately. This and oh, and what does this cost? Nothing. It's included in the price of that $9 a month DVD by mail. Whatever plan you're on, you get this for free. 15,000 movies on demand on your laptop. I, even there's an app for that too. So you can watch that on your iPad or your iPhone. And what, what's mind blowing about this is when in your life have you ever been able to watch a movie that you want, that you choose, and not pay? on a per movie basis. Never, it's never happened before. You can buy a ticket to a movie, you can rent a DVD, you can watch pay-per-view, but you're always paying per movie. So if you get a bad one, you're just screwed. You've just given that money away. This introduces the concept of movie surfing. You can literally sit down with your spouse Start playing a movie and you're like, ah, oh, this is terrible. Let's try another one. With absolutely no cost, no, no downside to that. Um, or if someone said, you know, do you ever see Twister? It's a terrible movie, but the, the hurricane scene, the tornado scenes are great. So you just watch Twister, fast, you know, skim through to that point and watch just that part. Or, you know, did you ever see the end of The Sixth Sense? <laughs> you know, it's quite a shock there. Okay, so just watch that part. Um, so I said there's no downside. There actually is a downside, and that is, if you know anything about psychology, this this makes movies somehow less special. There's no cost. There's no barrier. There's no there's no stakes in picking a bad movie, right, or picking a good movie. So it literally sort of devalues the whole movie watching thing. It's kind of interesting. Um, when, when, when you have all you want for free anytime, it's somehow less special, which is too bad. But still, an amazing, amazing development. Um, um, there we go. And um, also, this is pretty cool. Oh, the problem with the Netflix thing, by the way, is that um, most of the movies are pretty old. There are no like new on DVD movies there. Uh, the huge majority of them are from the 80s and the 90s. Um, and that's obviously because of the movie studios saying, no, 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 Netflix, we're still making money from this. You can't put it up there for instant free watching. Um, Voodoo, on the other hand, specializes in new movies streamed over the internet in the same way. Um, the, you pay per movie, four bucks, and, um, uh, but there's no waiting and there's no coming by mail and the quality is phenomenal. They have uh, standard definition, high definition, and then something almost toward Blu-ray called HDX, which is an even higher than high definition thing that looks really phenomenal. And um, so for, for several years, they sold this as a set-top box, and you'd buy the Voodoo box. And what's great is there's no monthly fee, right? It's just you pay every time you want to watch a movie. If you get busy for a few months, no harm done. You're not paying anything. Um, and no one was buying the box because the pub public hates set-top boxes. Um, so finally, just a couple months ago, they announced that they were discontinuing the box, but instead they were building in the service into TVs and Blu-ray players from all these companies. So now you get the Blu-ray player and it has Voodoo built in. And it works the same way, except there's no box, there's no additional remote. Uh, the quality is still spectacular. The movies come out the same day as the DVD. So you get the movie instantly um, when it's released. And even more interestingly, um, last month Walmart 
bought Voodoo. Walmart. So um, I don't know if that means we'll have like 39 cent movies. Um, but it, it does mean that the company will, will survive and thrive. And I'm, I'm a huge Voodoo nut. Um, everyone's saying, oh, the, these app phones are so cool with the multi-touch screens. Um, when is that going to come to my laptop? Well, it's come to the laptops. It's, it's there right now um, and, and to some of these desktop ones as well. Uh, but I can tell you that it's, it's sort of a bust because um, Windows or, or the Windows operating system was not designed from the ground up for multi-touch. And the apps that you're running on Windows were not designed for multi-touch. So the result is it's not like the iPhone or the iPad where everywhere you go, touch works. There are lots of places on the PC or in individual apps where touch doesn't work. And so as a result, you get into this thing where you're like, nothing happens. You're just getting grease on your screen. And you feel like an idiot. It's like, oh, well, I'll use the mouse. So it, you're constantly like, will it work here? No. Will it work here? No. So, and, and also, if you think about it, Windows wasn't designed for finger-sized pointing devices. right? So there's a lot of things that are just too small to click with your finger. And until everything is redesigned, the, the multi-touch screens won't really take off. Um, another really cool thing is these Pico projectors. I don't know if you've seen them. They're about this big, and they project an, a surprisingly large, bright image using lasers or LEDs um, onto the wall. Not this big and not this bright, but maybe this big. And if the lights are dim, it is that bright. And they're really, they're really cool. Um, they are building them into cell phones now. Um, which is also really cool if you want to give an instant, you know, oh, I'm in the elevator with the boss. Hey, boss, I've got a pitch to make for you. you know? And um, um, those are really, really cool. Uh, I was on a plane once in the early days when no one even knew this product category existed. And uh, we were playing, connecting my iPod to it. And we were watching a movie on the airplane ceiling with my kids. And like this, like this big. And it was great to watch the movie up there. but. What was even greater is the reactions of all the people around us who were like, what is that? They like, couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Um, Got to mention e-readers. Um, the, uh, the, no one knows how they're really selling, but um, this is uh, focus. OK, so this is the, um, this is the, the Sony reader. Um, this has a touch screen, which the uh, Kindle doesn't. Um, Although the, the problem is, um, did you notice what's wrong? <laughs> if you wanted to turn the page, would you swipe your finger right to left or left to right? It's backwards. This is how you turn to the next page. <coughs> it doesn't make any sense. You can switch it in preferences, but I guess it's designed by the Japanese, and they read the wrong way over there. So it makes sense to them. Um, but of course, the beauty of e-readers is this is this is e-ink. It looks very much like ink on paper, although it's a gray background, and you cannot read without um, without uh, light. Um, as opposed to this puppy, I showed you this thing's e-reader, which has illumination. You can read it in any light. Although this does well in direct sunshine, this one does not do well in direct sunshine. So it's just a question of do you more do more reading in bed at night or on the beach. That's, that's how you pick. Um, you can change the type size. Um, those with really rough vision can do this. Um, and um, I, I, I personally think that, the, that we're going to look at this and laugh in a couple of years. Like, look how slow it is to, to, to turn pages. It's like, oh, OK. Sometimes it doesn't even work. OK, you know, her heaving bosom uh, sweated, and he suddenly what? <laughs> he suddenly, ah, so it just takes too long. Um, so this is, I think this EE thing is going to look Cro-Magnon to us in a couple of years. It's going to be like, I can't believe anybody bought those. Um, unless they get really small and really cheap, and that might, that might be. This is, this is very heavy to read for a long time. Um, but the, the reading itself is, is very nice. Everyone talk. Oh, here's here's my video about the Nook. This terrible Barnes. Nook. Oh, terrible Barnes and I Noble am one. Nook, the world's most advanced ebook reader. Come see Nook. 
Hey, excuse me. Hi, I'm uh, David Pogue. What is this all about? I am the Barnes & Noble Nook, the world's most advanced ebook reader. You know, it looks an awful lot like the Amazon Kindle. Oh. What, what's the problem? Speak not that name. What, Kindle? Ah. Sorry. Uh, who, who's your little friend here? <sighs> That's footnotes. Footnotes? What do you mean? Footnotes. After I speak, keep... Look, I'll show you. <clears throat> Nook has the world's first color touch screen. Well, technically it's the same black and white screen as the Kindle. Uh, the color is a little color strip for tap commands. It's a little balky. On Nook, you can shop for books anywhere and download them in 30 seconds. And not just on a cellular network like the, uh, the, the Kindle. Not just on the cellular network. Also on Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, it can't get onto any Wi-Fi network that has a welcome screen. Hey, I'm just saying. Nook's catalog has over one million books. Well, yes. Though, more than half the books are old, free, out-of-copyright books scanned by Google, with typos and stuff. You know what I really like about ebooks is how you can change the font when your eyes are getting tired. I'll tell you what I don't like about ebooks, though, is once I've bought an ebook, it's stuck on here. I can't lend it, I can't resell it when I'm done. But with Nook, you can lend it, wirelessly, for free. Mmm, yeah, uh, about that. You can only lend books that the publisher okays to lend, which right now is only about half the catalog. And even then, you can only lend a book once, and only for two weeks. You are really getting on my nerves. You know, it looks like the, uh, the Nook is actually smaller than the Kindle, although it looks to be a, a good bit thicker and fatter. Uh, that's because there's a... Anyway, all right, well, you can see that. So, a lot of people say, well, you know, the e-book, the e-ink is much better for your eyes because you don't get eye strain like you do when you look at an LCD screen, um, to which I say, who gets eye strain looking at an LCD screen? I mean, I, I look at my laptop all day. I don't get eye strain. We look at our computers eight hours a day. Is, is there anyone here who gets eye strain looking at a computer all, all day, who does not also get eye strain looking at something like this all day? I, I think the whole eye strain is, is a myth put out by that e-ink company. But anyway, um, finally, before I, I, I leave you, I just want to tell you about this one thing that you have to get right now. It's, a, it's called Readability. It's a free web, web browser bookmarklet. It basically, it takes, well here I can show you, it takes any, um, um, it takes any um, web page, here, let's go to the New York Times, and it, let's say I'm reading some article, and here is all the stuff, links and blinking flash and ads and blinkers and just stuff, I just want to read, I, can I just read this article? So look what it, if I click this button that it puts on your menu bar, watch what happens. It turns into an ebook. All that stuff goes away. Plain black text on your choice of colored background, nice big font, so you can read it. No links, no blinks, no ads, and it's free. It is phenomenal. Um, it's called readability. Go, go grab it. Um, so anyway, books aren't going away. Um, there's a lot going on in all of this stuff, but uh, meanwhile, a lot of it's really exciting. Just keep your eye on the possibilities. And um, all this stuff is free to play with if you want to come up here. Thanks so much for joining me.